everyone. Uh, tonight we're going to continue our um, discussion of looking for uh, patterns that help us understand the scriptures. Uh, we've talked about uh, recurring words, words and phrases that repeat in the text. Like remember we were talking about uh, uh, the word wisdom in 1 Corinthians 1 through 4 and how that recurs many, many times. That shows you the theme that's in uh, uh, that passage. We also talked about last week uh, structural patterns. Like remember the, the creation account starts and God said and let there be and God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning day one and that same pattern repeats itself throughout the creation account. You saw this, a similar type thing in uh, the repeated patterns in the letters to the seven churches in, in Asia. Remember that? Where he says uh, to the angel of the church at these things says he that I know uh, to him that overcomes he that has an ear to hear let him hear that's repeated in all those letters so anytime you can find a structural pattern that's repeated in scripture you can uncover themes that are that are there uh, that the writer has put in that uh, book now tonight we're going to talk about similarity of content in a particular book of scripture Always, and I don't make this clear enough, in every situation, in every class that we talk about in here, I'm talking about studying individual books of Scripture as a, as a unit by themselves. I'm not talking about in any of these classes putting Scriptures together from different books, okay? I'm just talking about how to study the book of James, how to study the book of Ephesians, how to study the book of Samuel. Because each of those books is a unit with a start and a finish, and you've got to treat it as a unit in order to study it in context. Now, when we talk about similarity of content, we're talking about um, either stories or um, accounts or parables or um, maybe uh, symbolism that repeats itself in a book. It's not the same necessarily as a word or a phrase uh, repeating itself, but uh, I want to illustrate it, at least first of all tonight, uh, talking about similarity of content in Luke's gospel. Now, we could do this with, with different types of themes, but um, there are several passages in Luke where you have stories, and all of these stories are similar to each other. Because all of these stories in Luke's gospel deal some way with riches and so forth. In fact, you'll find the word rich or riches in these different stories. And you can, you know, we talked about recurring words and how you uncover themes like that. But in Luke's gospel, this is a definite theme. If you look at uh, Luke chapter 12, um, anytime you can find one of these, it's like finding a vein of gold. You've got a definite something that the writer is trying to emphasize there. In uh, Luke chapter 12, you've got the story of the rich fool. And uh, it's in verses uh, 13 through uh, 21. And guess how many Gospels have the story of the rich fool? Just one. The Gospel of Luke. And it's interesting because it's, the, it's part of a theme of stories that are similar that all have to do with riches. So two guys are arguing over their inheritance. Jesus tells them a story of this guy that makes so many crops that he doesn't have a place to, to store his crops. And, uh, you know, what's he going to do? He's got this dilemma because he's got too much stuff. Uh, should he... Uh, tear down the barns he has and build bigger barns so he can store his stuff for himself and, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. The guy's selfish. And so he, uh, God comes to him and says, you're going to die tonight, you fool. And all this stuff you've stored up, whose will it be? So is it everyone that is, stores up things for himself and is not rich toward God. So that's the story. Well, okay, if that, was, if that story was just all by itself, it'd still be a good story. But as you keep reading in the Gospel of Luke, you get over to Luke chapter 16, and we've got another story over here. 
about the shrewd manager. This is a this is a man that works for a rich man. You've got the word rich here in 16.1, Luke 16.1. This is a business manager. And the thing about this business manager is he is dishonest with other people's money. And he lies about other people's money. And if you go down to, you know, you he gets fired from his job. And he, um, because he, he cheats his former boss, he gets uh, taken in by some of the people that he um, cheated in favor of. You know, it's a weird story. But the point of the story is in verses 11 and 12. See, and notice the word wealth and riches in here. And he says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. And so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? See, again, you've got the word riches. And it's a story about a guy that involved wealth and, and actually being dishonest with wealth. Okay, even if you just had those two, you wouldn't think too much was up. But that's not all. Luke's not done yet. See? Also, guess how many Gospels have the story of the dishonest steward? It only appears in the Gospel of Luke. It's another part of his theme about wealth and riches that only Luke has in that Gospel. Then you go to uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 19. And everybody knows this story. The story of the rich man and Lazarus. See, we had the rich fool in chapter 12, and now this guy's just called the rich man and Lazarus. See, the word rich is, one of, is a recurring word that occurs in riches, you know, in the last uh, story. It's a recurring word and a recurring theme in these particular stories. They're different stories, but they're all stories about riches, see? It's similar content. Um, rich man and Lazarus, you know, the rich man is dressed in fine clothes and he eats well every day and this beggar's at his, soul, at, at his gate and the beggar doesn't get anything to eat and then they both die and the rich man goes to hell and, and the, the beggar uh, gets carried away to Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side at the great banquet table. And uh, so the point is you're not supposed to be selfish. You're supposed to give to people that have need. Well, wasn't there a similar point in that story of the rich fool? Because when he had too many crops, he, he said, what shall I do? I've got way more than I can use. What do you think he should have done? Sure. He should have given some away to some people that didn't have anything. But he never even thought about sharing with anybody. See, it was about... And the point of that story was, so is everyone who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. So now you've got another story here about a rich man that is selfish that will not share his goods. That is similarity of content with this other story. You say, well, wait a minute. There was another story back here that was a whole lot like this story. I mean, it wasn't exactly the same, but it was about being selfish with riches. And here we go again. We've got another story about riches and about being selfish with riches. All right, then you've got um, the story of uh, the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 18. Now, it's interesting that the story of the rich young ruler is in, I believe, all three synoptic gospels. At least it's in Matthew and Luke, and it may be in Mark too. But it's not unique to Luke. And if it was the only story in Luke about this kind of thing, then I wouldn't think too much of it. But since Luke has the rich fool and the dishonest steward and the rich man and Lazarus and the rich young ruler, see, to Luke, it's part of a major strain here. It's part of a major series of stories that he's trying to emphasize this one point in the gospel. So here's this man, and he's got great possessions, and he's so tied to these possessions that, that if it keeps him from following Jesus... He can't give them up. And, and uh, so if you go down to when Jesus makes the point, look at verse 23 and 24. This is chapter 18, verse 23 and 24. 
When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. And Jesus looked at him and said, How difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. See, that might even be a way to state Luke's theme that he's working on here. It's difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, and he did mean a sewing needle. The Greek word is rapidos, which means a sewing needle, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they properly understood that that was impossible. But look at verse 26 and 27. Those who heard this asked, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. See? So if you, if you read the rest of these stories that he's already presented, what was the problem with these rich people? They were selfish with their riches. Or, in the case of the one, they were dishonest with them. Either selfish or dishonest with the riches. So it wasn't just riches, but it was being selfish and dishonest. And, and, and uh, I guess, you know, you kind of tend towards selfishness sometimes there. So there's that story. Then there's the rich tax collector. Luke 19. Now see, we call it the story of Zacchaeus. But... The word Zacchaeus doesn't occur all the way through the book of Luke. But the idea of rich people does. And look how, look how Luke introduces the story in Luke 19.1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. See? Why would Luke say he was wealthy? He was rich. Well, if you've read all these other stories... You're saying, okay, here we go again. You know. But if you read the story, you know, Jesus sees him up in the tree and he says, uh, I want to go home with you. But look down at verse 8 when Zacchaeus <coughs> repents and, and comes to salvation. He says, Look, Lord, here and now, uh oh, what am I going to do? I give half of my possessions to the poor. Now, that's not like that rich fool in chapter 12, is it? See, he had so many possessions, he didn't have to build bigger barns or do something. It never occurred to him to give away to people that had need. But now this guy is repenting and becoming a follower of Jesus. And he says, I'm giving half of my possessions to the poor. That's the, that's the unselfish part. Look at the second half. And if I have cheated anybody, which story is that like up here? Speak up. Yeah, the shrewd manager or the dishonest steward there, see? That's the story that that's like. So in Zacchaeus' statement there in verse 8, he captures the major points of all of those stories about the rich people. Half of my goods I'm giving to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to restore fourfold. So you've got the rich tax collector, <coughs> which is what I like to call the story of Zacchaeus because that helps it fit into the theme that it's actually a part of in the Gospel of Luke. And then finally, you have the widow's mite, and that is over in chapter 21. Look at 21. Jesus sees the rich people putting in their contributions in the temple treasury. As he looked up, chapter 21, verse 1, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts in the temple treasury. And he also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Obviously, we've got a contrast here or a comparison between the rich and the poor. And uh, he said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put in more than the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty had put in all she had to live on. He's talking about sacrificial giving <coughs> as opposed to just giving out of the overflow. So, you know, if that was the only story in here, you wouldn't look at it as hard, but there's this whole string of stories that all deal with a similar theme. That is called similarity of content. Okay? And when you find a book and you can find stories that are, that are alike through there, then you know that that writer is trying to strongly emphasize that particular theme. And you're on very solid ground. This is actually here, and this is actually how it's put together. By the way, no other gospel but Luke has the story of the widow's mite. No other gospel but Luke has the story of Zacchaeus. No other gospel but Luke has the rich man and Lazarus. 
No other gospel but Luke has the dishonest steward or the rich fool. Which shows you that Luke was doing this on purpose. See? It's like a recurring word, except it's like a recurring story. You understand this, Brother Mike? Would you include the, the parable of the ten bus there in later chapter 19? Is that a financial Yeah, yeah. And same, same. yeah, it's sort of like the talents, and, yeah. and that probably could be included, the, ter- the parable of the minus. Though I'm, uh, the reason I probably didn't is I'm not sure the word rich or riches is used in there. It might be, but if it is, you probably find it in there. But um, that's the reason I didn't include it, and I, and I just um, skipped over it. Yeah, but uh, I, I did this real quickly, and I just didn't think about that one. But um, I probably, because of this, would include it. I'll tell you what else I would include. And it would be back in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 is Luke's version of um, the um, Sermon on the Mount, kind of, except it's not said to be necessarily the same sermon. It's a similar sermon to the Sermon on the Mount. But, you know, in the Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount, look down at Luke 6, verse 20. Matthew says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. But Luke just says, blessed are you poor. And um, look down here to um, verse 21. Blessed are you who are hungry now. See, Matthew says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. So the poor and the hungry are blessed. But now look at verse 24. Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. The rest of these stories that you see up there are a really good commentary on Jesus' sayings. You know? So, there's definitely something going on in the Gospel of Luke about wealth and riches and the rich and the poor. It's there. And how you identify it being there is by noticing similarity of content. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to give you another illustration here. Nothing like illustrations. Any book you're studying, try to look for similarity of content. Now, this little study is of uh, just one little strand of similar content in the Gospel of Matthew. We studied the Gospel of Luke uh, here a moment ago. Now we're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew. Um In the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 3, look at chapter 3. This is a little more subtle uh, than the other one, but um, it's pretty obvious. Matthew chapter 3 is where um, Jesus gets baptized. And uh, John is is, uh, calling the people to repentance. And uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees want to come to his baptism, but they don't want to repent. Drop down to verse 11, Matthew 3, verse 11. (coughs) John says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering the wheat into the barn, and burning the chaff up with unquench, uh, unquenchable fire. Now, when you're winnowing wheat, like you're taking that tool, that rake-like thing, and you're taking the, the wheat that's just been cut with all of the garbage in it, and you take it, and you throw it up in the air, and the wind blows the chaff away, and the grains of wheat fall back down, you're separating, you're making a separation between the wheat and the chaff. See, it's either Holy Spirit or fire in the previous verse. It's wheat or chaff here in this verse. That's a separation of either this or that. Okay, so God makes a separation between those two. And it's what we call a dichotomous separation. It's not separating into three or four categories. It's how many categories? Two categories. Wheat or chaff, Holy Spirit or fire. Okay, but now... Look in chapter 13. See, several times through um, Matthew you get this. I think you may also have this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in the 
in the story of the wise man and the foolish man. You know, you built a house on the rock or on the sand. Wise or foolish, that's kind of a dichotomy there that you've got as well. But look at Matthew 13. You've got a string of parables here in Matthew 13. And you remember the, the um, parable of the wheat and the tares um, in um, verse 24? Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while he was sleeping, or everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, went away, but when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servant said, Well, do you want us to go pull them up? No, he said. Because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat. Let both of them grow until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters. Now look at this phrase. First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. And then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now compare that verse, verse 30, with Matthew 3, verse 12. And see if you see any similarities between those two verses. Compare 13.30 with Matthew 3.12 and see if you see any similarities between the two verses. Do you or don't you? Yeah. So here we, here we go again. But it's sweet. And it, one's in a barn and one's in the fire. You know, same, same type thing. Now, right in this same chapter, there's another parable. It's a different story, but it's the same story. And that's the story of the good fish and the bad, bad fish, or you would call it the dragnet, maybe. Look at verse 47. Verse 47. And see, the, the explanation of the parable of the weeds is in 36 and following about how the angels are going to separate the, um, the sons of Satan from the sons of God and the kingdom. And going to, like, uh, look at uh, verse 41. We'll, we'll do the end of the first parable first. Uh, the Son of Man will send out His angels and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil and they will throw them into the fiery furnace where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth and then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. So, separate the righteous from the wicked. You know, the wheat from the tares. Go down to verse 47. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. And they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad fish away. So what's this got to do with the wheat and the tares? It's just good fish and bad fish being separated. You know, it's a separation being made between the good and the bad, just like the wheat and the tares, you know. It's a different story, but it's the same story. You see what I'm saying? One's the story of a farmer and one's the story of a fisherman, but it's, it's a story about separating things into two categories. This is similarity of content. Okay? Then um, you also find it uh, in uh, Matthew 25. Turn to Matthew 25. <laughs> so this idea of God making a separation between the righteous and the wicked is, is a kind of a strand through here in the book of Matthew. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him. And by the way, the one about the wheat and the tares was about when the end of the age comes, you know. Uh, when he comes in glory, he will sit on his heavenly throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. And uh-oh, what's he going to do? He's going to separate the people from one another. Like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Sheep and goats, good fish and bad fish, Wheat and tares, Holy Spirit and fire. Am I making this up or is this actually in here? Okay? So, through the Gospel of Matthew, you've got this strand of stuff that's about God making a dichotomous separation between people into two categories. You know? And, and so he says, uh, the sheep he's going to put on the right hand, the goats he's going to put on the left hand. Verse 33, and he's going to say to those on his right hand, verse 34, and then he's going to say to those on his left hand, verse 41. So it's just an expanded version of these earlier stories. 
it's like you've got the same story here as you've got in the dragnet. You've got the same story here that you've got in the wheat and the tares. What's, what do we call this? Similarity of content. Now, if something is repeated over and over by, by an author, what does that tell you? Order. It's important. It's a, it's a major idea here. It's a, it's a major thing that he wants you to get. And uh, it's not just our idea that it's a major idea. It's obvious that it is because you've got this repeated similar content in a book. All right? Let me show you another example of the same thing. Now, this sometimes happens you know, in a given chapter. Sometimes, like I showed you in the book of Luke, uh, it happens throughout a whole um, <coughs> book. This is an example where... Um, Jesus' Jesus's, um, teaching in Matthew 24 is actually illustrated by three stories in the end of Matthew 24 and in Matthew 25. The story of the faithful and unfaithful steward, the story of the wise and foolish virgins, and the story of the resourceful and lazy servants, which we would usually call the parable of the talents. See? But what we would miss is, if we call it the parable of the talents, it's talking about two distinctly different kinds of people and their distinctly different responses to Jesus. See, Just like the wise virgin, virgins and the foolish virgins, the faithful steward and the unfaithful steward, the lazy servants and the resourceful servants. See? That's the actual comparison that's going on in the passage. So <clears throat> Jesus has been talking in Matthew 24 about the coming of the Son of Man and how he's going to come when you don't even know it and surprise everybody. Look at Matthew 24 verse um, uh, 45. This is the um, first parable that he's going to tell about uh, trying to illustrate this, what he's been talking about in Matthew 24. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for the servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Now one of the similarities in these stories is in every single story here, every one of these three stories, the master or the main character or whatever is gone away for a while. And... In every one of these stories, in some fashion, they're trying to get ready for him to return, to come back. See? And in Matthew 24, Jesus has been talking about when he finally returns. He's going to go away and he's going to return someday. So, you know, uh, it'll be good for this servant whose master finds him, you know, faithfully doing what he's supposed to be doing when he returns. Verse 47, I tell you the truth, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked. See, he gave an illustration of a faithful servant. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, underline this part, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect and at an hour when he's not aware and will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, see, I'm a, I'm a nut for watching for these recurring themes. So I would flip back to Matthew 13, and I would look at the end of the parable of the wheat and the tares in verse 42, Matthew 13, 42. I'd say, I saw this before somewhere. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, and there will be what? Weeping, Weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And now here at the end of this, it says, and there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And I saw that phrase before in something about the end of the world. Okay, so the first story compares, you know, this master's going away. It compares a servant who is busy doing what the master left him there to do when the master returns, as opposed to one who got lazy while he was away and the master catches him not doing what he's supposed to do. Pretty simple. All right, then, the second story, uh, the wise and foolish virgins, 
uh, is about the waiting on the bridegroom. See, again, we're waiting on somebody to arrive. At that time, the kingdom of heaven, verse 1 of chapter 25, will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. See, this is sort of in that dichotomy type thing, too, isn't it? This or that. And uh, the foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. Now, let's think about that. What's the difference in just taking your lamp and the oil in it? Say, we're going to go wait for the bridegroom. I'm just going to take my lamp and the oil that's in it. But what's the difference in that and the one that takes their lamps and they take extra oil? What, what's the difference in the mindset of the two? Well, the... They had oil in their lamps. <laughs> Which one is one prepared to be there when the bride Well, for however long it takes, that's it, right there. See, the idea is one group of them is prepared for however long it needs to be. Now, remember the last story. What was that wicked servant saying in his mind? My master's been what? He's been gone for a long time. See? Now you've got the wise ones that are taking extra oil. And see, the older you get and the more trials that come upon you, you realize how hard it is to last the long haul. See? And you got to make sure you've got your extra oil and you're ready for whatever comes your way to last the long haul. So, anyway, um, look at verse uh, 5. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. Now, does that look familiar? Doesn't that look a lot like verse 48 in the previous chapter? Or am I just making this up? See, that's called similarity of content. It's two different stories. But it's the same story. Do you understand what I mean? It's a different story, but it's the same pretext in the story. It's the same idea. Just like those stories of the rich people were different stories, but it was like telling the same story in a different form over and over again to emphasize a theme. So, of course, the midnight cry comes, the bridegroom's here, and, and the wise ones woke up and trimmed their lamps, but the foolish ones were out of oil and they were in trouble. And uh, what are we going to do? We've got to go buy some more oil. It was too late to buy more oil. So they were locked out and the door was shut. Look at verse 11, 12, and 13. Later the others came, Sir, sir, they said, open the door. But he said, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, here it is, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Compare that verse, verse 13, with Matthew 24, 44. So you must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So he tells one story to illustrate that. Then he tells another story to illustrate that. Then he tells the story of the talents. See, we usually just look at the story of the talents like it's all by itself. But it's not all by itself. In the story of the talents, look at how it starts out. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. So the master's going away. Wasn't the master gone away in the first story? And the bridegroom it was away on the second story? So he says, it's like a master, a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Look at um, verse 45 of chapter 24. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? That's sort of like he's entrusted his property to them, right? Very similar. Similarity of content, okay? So then he gives them the different... Um, amounts of money, blah, blah, blah. Look at verse 19. I've got a box around verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned. See, that reminds me of verse 5, where he said, the bridegroom was a long time in coming. And that reminds me of 2448, where the first guy said, my master is staying away for a long time. Is it really there? You need a commentary to tell you it's there? No. You can put your pencil on it. See? That's what I'm talking about here. 
So then the master comes back and he, he commends the ones that actually were busy and did something with his property positively while he was gone. And then um, down here at verse 26, to the one that buried it in the ground, he says, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, gather where I have not scattered. You should have put my money to the deposit with the bankers, and when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him. Give it to the one who has ten talents. Um, verse 29, For everyone who has will be given more, and he who does not have will and he who has will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness. Uh-oh. Where what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that sets the bells off in my head again. Bing, 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 bing. And I go back and I find that phrase in, in uh, where it was at the end of chapter 24. And then I go back to earlier passages in Matthew and I find that same phrase. This is called looking for similarity of content. It's not that there's just a particular word recurring, though there are some similar phrases. It's that the stories are the same even though they're different. Do you understand? Okay. I know at first this is not necessarily easy, but there's this is all through the different books of the Bible. And one of the things you're looking for as you study a particular book... Now, I'm not talking about... Let's make this clear. I'm not talking about if you find a story in in uh, John that's similar to a story in Matthew, like the feeding of the 5,000. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about one writer in a particular book repeating thematic type things that are on the same idea... That's what I'm talking about. Similarity of content, themes, in particular books. Okay. There's nothing like illustrations to illustrate the point. So anytime you're studying, this is a real easy one for us because we all grew up on the book of Acts and we all grew up uh, listening to the conversion stories in the book of Acts. But have you ever thought of the fact but see, Luke, the Gospel of Luke goes through, and then there's Pentecost, which we're going to talk about Sunday morning in our sermon. And the plan of salvation is given, and the Gospel is obeyed on Pentecost. And then there's story after story after story of where the Gospel was presented, and people obeyed the Gospel. And you can read about all these different ones. They're different stories, but they're all the story of how the Gospel was presented, and someone accepted it, and they obeyed the Gospel, and they're, you know, they're the same story. So the story of the 3,000 on Pentecost, the Samaritans in chapter 8, the eunuch who listens to Philip, uh, the household of Cornelius and how they're converted, the conversion of Lydia, the conversion of the jailer. That's just another example of similarity of content in a particular book where you're trying to emphasize a particular thing. See? And he's trying to emphasize, obviously, the process of hearing and obeying the gospel of Christ, how the gospel is presented, how people accept it, how they obey it. He's illustrating that over and over and over again. See, he's doing that on purpose. Brother Gary, yes, sir. Well, another reoccurring theme in that book, to use that term, is that repeated over and over, and sometimes explained a little more fully, is that the message is the death, burial, and resurrection. Absolutely. Absolutely. Occurring over and over and over and over. And since you brought that up, that's this chart right here. See, now, what you're actually talking about is the speeches in the book of Acts. You're talking about the, the places in Acts where there is a sermon. There's a gospel sermon. There's a, there's a presentation in some form of the gospel. And as Gary pointed out, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ in particular is a major theme in all of these um, sermons. And uh, it, different ones are given from different perspectives, but there are several speeches. There's the Pentecost speech. There's Stephen's speech in chapter 7 before the Sanhedrin. Uh, there's Peter's speech in the household of Cornelius. And there's... Uh, Paul's speech in Acts 13 at the synagogue of Antioch of Pisidia. And then I think it's Acts uh, 24, Paul before Felix, you know. 
And then there's his big speech in front of Agrippa in Acts 26. And there are very similar themes in all of those speeches as the gospel was presented. So you've got a recurring theme of how it was presented. And then in those in that previous chart, you've got a recurring theme of how people obeyed the gospel. See? And this is on purpose. It's not an accident. See, it's too... It's too um, blatant to be an accident. It's on purpose. It's just like those stories in Luke about the rich. That is on purpose, believe me. That's there for a reason to emphasize those points. Some people... Have you ever, have you ever had a harmony of the Gospels? One of those things that, that... Like McGarvey did one where you try to put all the Gospels together into one. That is a major travesty. The reason it's a major travesty is... Because if you do that, you destroy the themes, the veins that the Gospels have individually. Some Gospels have very different themes than other Gospels do. And if you mash them all together into one, you destroy that completely. See, they, We have four Gospels for a reason. There were different things that God wanted to communicate in each one of those Gospels. See, How do we know what those different things were? We uncover these themes. And there you can see that one, and you can see that one, and you can see that. They approach the material to advance these themes. And the Holy Spirit did that intentionally. So um, it's called similarity of content. Uh, you can do it with any book of the Bible, Old or uh, New Testament. Um, I'll um, give you one more illustration, and then uh, we'll call it a night. This is the book of Daniel. It and my Lord deliver Daniel. Remember that? Okay. But there is actually a statement or a phrase in, in uh, Daniel, uh, our God is able to deliver us in, in chapter 3, and I think it's repeated somewhat in chapter 6. But you've got three stories in the first six chapters that are almost, they're different stories, but they're a lot alike. In the first chapter, you've got this story of these three young men, and they're, they're taken captive, and, and Daniel's with them, the four, I guess. And uh, all of a sudden, even though they're under the law of Moses, and they're told to eat only the foods that are clean, according to the book of Leviticus, their captors want them to eat all this unclean food that they're not supposed to eat, according to the law of Moses. So they're, in, they're, they're at the mercy of their captors. What are they going to do? You know, they have a moral dilemma. Are we going to... Are we going to do the will of God or are we going to capitulate and, and just eat what they want us to eat? So they step up to the plate and they say, we want to just eat vegetables. You know, we don't want to eat the king's food and, and please give us a chance to do this. And, and so they do and it turns out that they look better than everybody else and God blesses them. So you have this story of this moral dilemma that comes. They step up to the plate and do the right thing. And then God blesses them. Right? You get over there to chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar builds this great big golden statue out there and says, everybody's going to fall down and worship this statue. So uh, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're, they're going to be forced to worship this idol when the music starts up. And they say, King, I'm sorry, but our law says we can't worship anybody but God. And and we can't worship your idol. And the king says, well, if you don't worship the idol, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And they said, well, you may throw us in the fiery furnace, but our God is able to deliver us. But if, if whether he delivers us or not, we're not going to worship your idol. So the music starts up. They don't fall down. They do throw them in the fiery furnace. But they look in there, and there's not three of them in there. There's four of them. There's some heavenly being in there with them. And they're not even singed. And... And the people that throw them in the furnace get burned, and they come out without a, even smelling like smoke, you know. So it's a different story, but it's the same story. Moral dilemma. Are you going to step up and do the right thing or capitulate? They do the right thing, and God blesses them. God delivers them. You get over to chapter 6. All of a sudden, King Darius, you know, is convinced by his governors and satraps and everything to say that nobody can pray to anybody except to the king. 
And the Bible says, well, Daniel's been going in his room and opening his windows towards Jerusalem, and he's been praying to God three times every day. But all of a sudden, this law is passed that you can't pray to anybody but King Darius. So Daniel hears this law. Daniel's got a moral dilemma. Am I going to capitulate, or am I going to step up and do the right thing? It says he went right back to his room and kept praying to God just like he had been. And so they took him, and they threw him in the den of lions, just like they threw the other ones in fiery furnace. Fiery furnace, den of lions. Six of one, half dozen of the other. See what I'm saying? It's the same story. It's just different, but it's the same. What do we call this church? Similarity of content. Look for it. It will help you get to the major points in books. Y'all have a great night, and we'll see you.